we're now live. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Paloma Trascasa. I'm going to be the chair of this session. Welcome to the Royal Meteorological Society Virtual Student and Early Career Scientist Conference. And thank you for joining us on the poster session B. Um, each presentation will take uh, will be three minutes long, and then after each presentation, we ha will have a two minute Q and A um, session. So you can ask your questions using the chat um, space that you have on your right in Demio. And a very important thing to remember is that you can download the handouts in the handouts um, section. You can download the um, posters from all the speakers, so then you can zoom in and out in your own in your own laptops. Perfect. So let's start with our first speaker, uh, Daniel Hoare. Hello, Daniel. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Daniel Hoare. I'm a second year PhD student from the University of Bristol. And today I'll be talking about the London Greenhouse Gas Project, which my PhD is a part of. So as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, climate change, they're very hot topics at the moment. Um, very important topics. There's a lot of international policy in regards to these topics. As part of this policy, every year, governments across the world have to support their estimated greenhouse gas emissions each year. And they do this using uh, inventories and bottom-up methods, which take data such as fuel usage, um, petrol sales, electricity generation, to estimate greenhouse gas emissions. Now, because these inform a lot of very important policy, it's very key that we have good understanding of what these numbers um, how accurate they are. So there's a second method we can use called top-down methods, where we take atmospheric measurements and combine this with atmospheric models and statistical methods in order to get a independent answer of how much greenhouse gas emissions are being emitted. The UK is one of three countries that do this at the national scale already. Um, and what the London Greenhouse Gas Project is doing is using a similar network, but looking at the London at the city scale the reason we want to look at the city scale is because cities are hotspots for climate emissions, um, especially CO2 and methane and other gases like that. Um, and there's also in places like London, there's local policy, local government, which has the power to make local changes to um, reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. So we're developing a new network, um, which will then be able to inform data to policymakers in London. We have an existing site measurements in the Thames Bar in central London that's been going for about two years. Um, currently in press, we've got some model development results for that. So we've looked at some of the transport modeling for the atmosphere, and we've seen some good results from there. Um, there's a few other instruments around London in places like the BT Tower, which other groups um, have started running, and we're hoping to be able to do some data sharing with them. But one of the key things we want to do is install eight further sites around the city in order to get a full network to get full coverage of London, so we can make sure we're catching all emissions within the city. So my role is as the uh, one of the modelers in this group. So I'm currently working on doing the uh, Bayesian modeling, which is our statistical methods, which allows us to capture this atmospheric data and use it with the atmospheric model to work out what the emissions are. So there are a couple of things I need to do is I need to make it work with the high resolution system. So where we're working with city scales rather than national scales. Um, but there's also we're using low cost, low maintenance instruments. So I need to be able to handle things like instrument drift. So what I'll be doing for the next few months is be running some synthetic data experiments um, now that the code is set up. And with this, I'll be able to ensure that our code and our model is fully characterized and we're confident it's ready so that as the new uh, instruments are installed over the coming weeks and months, I'll be able to start um, getting total um, emission estimates for London ready um, as soon as that's possible. Thank you for listening. A question from Ben. So how is the data sent back to you from the deployed sensors? Okay, so I believe the way we are doing this is um, where possible we are piggybacking on Wi Fi signals, um, but it's also possible to um, put in. Uh, SIM cards and get it to use those sort of data networks to send data back. Perfect. We have another question from Tom. Um, Tom says, 
are there other proposed sites for new sensors? Yes, so um, there's a bunch of different sites. Most of them are various tall buildings such as church spires, uh, city tower blocks, um, resident blocks, that kind of thing. Uh, the two most likely sites we're going to get in the next few weeks is a church in the northwest um, and also on the Harrow campus of the University of West Lifland. Thanks, and we have time for uh, one more question from Hannah. Hannah says, great poster and great presentation. How much variation in uh, methane emissions do you expect from the scale of London? So there are a few um, different scales uh, we expect. So, for instance, you expect more emissions in central London than the outskirts of London, but also there's a lot of um, point source emitters such as uh, waterworks. So in the Thames Barrier site, we're right next to a water treatment facility, which is a huge source of methane emissions. So we expect to see a lot higher emissions there than we would say in the National Physics Laboratory, which is in Teddington, which is next to a nice open field with not much um, local sources around. Well, thank you very much, Daniel. We also have many people say thank you, excellent presentation. But now we have to move on to our next speakers. Okay. To our next speaker. Thanks again, Daniel. So our next uh, speaker is Chris Boykin from the University of Reading. Hello, Chris. Hello. Okay. Just waiting for my poster. Brilliant. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Boykin, and I'm a PhD student in meteorology at the University of Reading in collaboration with Met Office. My project is extracting likely scenarios from high resolution forecasts in real time. Right now, forecasters must go through huge amounts of complex data before they can issue their forecasts. This is a challenge on its own, but during high impact time critical events, such as extreme rainfall, high winds or snowstorms, it becomes a significant challenge. To combat this challenge, I've developed an algorithm that will reduce an ensemble of data, say 18 different members, down to perhaps two to five representations of that ensemble. I do this using K-metoids clustering, which provides a member as the center point of the cluster. This method avoids some of the problems of other clustering methods, such as K-means, that provides a mean as the center, which smooths out significant and fine scale features that may be critically important to a forecast. The other benefit of K-metoids is the ability to change the calculation of the distance metric that's used to determine which member belongs to which cluster. I'm using the fraction skill score as the distance metric, which is a neighborhood verification method that focuses on domain-wide agreement between forecasts and can actually be converted into a real distance. In figure two, there's an example of how the algorithm takes a field, such as the wet bulb potential temperature, and first converts it into a gradient and then into a binary field via a threshold for use with the fraction skill score. The final plot is a result of the clustering where two of the members from the same cluster are plotted overlaid from one another so you can see how similar they are. But the primary focus of this work is not just the clustering, but to examine the traceability of the clusters, essentially how the membership within a cluster changes through lead time in a forecast. Traceability can be determined by looking at a specific time window when the clusters became, uh, start to become better defined, typically around a few days or so out from the forecast start date. At this point, specific scenarios develop within the model ensemble, which can then be extracted and presented to the forecasters. You can see an example of the traceability in figure three, where we have four sections in the top plot, one for each cluster. If a member appears within a cluster at a given time, you'll see a colored dot. The color is chosen by determining which cluster the member is part of the most often within that time window, which is the vertical uh, black dashed lines. Within that time window, the members fall, that fall closest to the center of the cluster the most often become the representative members and thereby the representative forecasts or scenarios that are presented to the forecasters, which you can see in figure four. Each of these plots represents a different evolution of events within the ensemble, uh, which the forecasters can then determine how probable each event is and issue any advisories necessary. That brings me to future work with the algorithm, uh, which it will include pandemic permitting, <laughs> applying it to forecasts in real time at Met Office and getting forecaster feedback directly. Um, I'll also be testing the algorithm with multiple variable choices and testing it on various other weather types. Right now it's focusing sort of on frontal regions as you can see in here on the plots. Um, and I'll be trying to see if it remains a sound technique and can be adapted to different situations. And that's my presentation. Are there any questions?
very much, Chris. That was excellent. Um, ben asked a question. He said, great poster, Chris. Did you compare a few different methods on top of k methods to the, determine that it was the best choice? Oh, well, great question. Mm -hmm. So we did compare k-means directly. Um, we didn't compare hierarchical clustering because that sort of comes at the thing at clustering a little differently. What it essentially does is uh, takes all the members and then creates small clusters going up sort of like um, an addendogram kind of fashion. And we wanted to compare all the members all at once. So hierarchical clustering wasn't really as useful for this process. But we did do a lot of testing with k-means versus k-metoids to see um, which had the best representation of um, a member of the cluster. Um, I have another question as I'm completely ignorant on the on the topic. Um, so can you use this um, this method to to produce long term climate forecasts or is it more applied to to meteorology? Oh, that is a great question. Right now it's just applied to um, to just forecasts in general. Uh, it hasn't been applied to any climate forecast yet, but that would be a really fascinating study to do in the future, just to see how well it works um, ultimately. Yeah, yeah that would be a fascinating one to study. So there's an, an, a great field, very promising. Well, Chris, um, thank you very much. We have to now move on to our next speaker. Uh, I would like to remind you all that you can download the posters from the handouts um, section here on your right, so you can zoom in and out each poster. So our next speaker is Max Coleman, PhD student from the University of Reading. Hello, Max. Great. I'm Max uh, from the University of Reading, and I will be talking to you about climate responses to short-lived pollutants. So uh, among the uh, short-lived climate pollutants, uh, three of the major ones are black carbon aerosol, sulfate aerosol, and ozone. And these pollutants have a direct effect on the atmosphere's radi radiation budget, but they also have uh, quite large and complicated uh, secondary effects called rapid adjustments. So to explain uh, rapid adjustments by way of example, uh, black carbon aerosol uh, absorbs incoming solar radiation, and that's its uh, direct radiative forcing but in doing so, it heats the local atmosphere, and this can cause changes in stratification and convection patterns. This can then affect cloud cover, and since clouds can reflect incoming solar radiation and absorb outgoing long-wave radiation, um, this has its own radiative forcing effect, which contributes to the overall uh, forcing, which is called effective radiative forcing. So these rapid adjustments um, have been studied a lot since the IPCC assessment report five, and a lot of the methods used to uh, analyze them don't distinguish between different mechanisms by which parameters such as cloud uh, cover can adjust. So again, using black carbon as an example, um, it can cause change in cloud cover by these uh, vertical heating changes, so causing stratification and convection changes, but also uh, emission changes differing around the world causes changes in large scale circulation patterns and the black carbon acting as cloud condensation nuclei can also affect cloud cover. So I'm hoping to use uh, model nudging as a uh, method of uh, separating these different mechanisms. Um, so I'm doing this with uh, the UK Earth system model running uh, atmosphere only global simulations um, with emissions in 1850 versus 2014. And uh, I'll run a series of simulations indicated in my third figure in my poster. So for example, if I nudge the horizontal winds, this should suppress any changes in circulation resulting from the change in emissions of, for example, black carbon. And hence, we don't get the cloud adjustment in response to the circulation changes we would have got, but we still get the adjustment in cloud to do with stratification, infection, and um, cloud condensation nuclei effects. Um, so by running a series of simulations, nudging a series of different parameters, um, I can hopefully separate out these different mechanisms 
um, contributing to uh, rapid adjustments such as cloud changes, but also things like uh, specific humidity changes since water vapor absorbs in outgoing long wave radiation as well. So, so far I've only ran simulations, um, uh, simulations for sulfate perturbation, uh, which is illustrated in my fourth figure, um, which agrees quite well with the UK ESM contribution to CMIP6. Um, and uh, I haven't got to the nitrons yet, so I can't present on that, unfortunately, but um, yeah, that's what I'm starting on at the moment. So I think that's everything I have time for. I didn't get a one minute reminder, but I think I'm done. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Sorry, apologies, I forgot to, to, <laughs> to remind you, I was listening with big attention. So we have a question from Ben. He says, since there are so many complex interactions to consider, did you have to limit the number of numerical experiments you could uh, do? If so, how did you decide what not to do or what was the most important variable to test? So to an extent, it's limited by what I can nudge uh, by default in the uh, UK Earth system model. The only things you can nudge with the existing setup is uh, the horizontal winds, UNV, and then potential temperature. Um, and you can nudge them, you can nudge it in the troposphere and not include the stratosphere, and then also include the stratosphere. So basically, my simulations cover everything I can do, which is basically five different um, sort of configurations of what I'm nudging. Um, so that, that's what limits it and that sort of a manageable uh, number in terms of simulations. Great, thank you. Um, I've got another question. So how long does it take for black carbon to, to cause um, an impact on the climate system once it's emitted? So what's the lifetime of black carbon in the atmosphere? So black carbon uh, and also the other two as well have, uh, I mean, as the name suggests, they're fairly short lived. And for, for these, it's on the time scale of sort of weeks. Um, so the, the, the climate effect is um, uh, like much bigger than, uh, say, carbon dioxide, but um, because it lasts a lot less time, it's not as, yeah. as large overall. Um, so yeah, so quicker compared to things like CO2 or, or meat. So you would need large quantities of black carbon to, to really have a, a last, long lasting effect. It, it's more if you increase the emissions, then you'll reach a new equilibrium concentration because they're continually being removed from the atmosphere. Whereas if you mm -hmm. emit CO2, it sort of lingers for hundreds of thousands of years. So um, yeah, just a, a big increase in emissions. Um, uh, yeah. Perfect. Well, uh, that was excellent, Max. Thank you very much. Now Thank we you. have to move on to our next uh, speaker, uh, Nila Rainiers. I'll let you know when you have one minute left. Sorry about that. It's difficult to, to yeah. Yeah, just a second, because I've been told to um, share my screen because, um, oh, okay, no, never mind. Um, seems like the correct version of the poster is showing, which is great. So, um, hi, I'm Nila Reniers. Um, I'm from the University of um, East Anglia in the first year of my PhD. And um, my research is on the effects of climate change on extreme droughts. Um, and focus area is areas of East Anglia, um, since this is a collaborative project with Anglia Water, a local water cap company. So for my research on droughts, I not only look at meteorological droughts characterized by um, yeah, subnormal level of precipitation, uh, but also on different types of hydrological droughts, such as uh, periods of low flow in rivers or groundwater droughts. But to investigate the influence of climate ch change on hydrological droughts, um, I will, among others, be forcing uh, rainfall runoff models with the outputs of climate models. But um, as you can see from um, the figures on the left hand side of the poster under the title Before BC, um, these 
um, simulations contain considerable errors and therefore um, yeah, these errors first as first step need to be corrected somehow before we can drive hydrological models with these climate projections. Um, so yeah, I'm showing the results of that first step here today in these maps um, from the left hand side of the poster by comparing the before and after maps, you can see that the bias correction method that I applied here was fairly successful in removing errors for the yeah, historical period. And if we then look at the right hand side of a poster and compare the before and after figures, you can see that um, the bias, bias correction method um, did not affect the climate change signal too much, which is what we wanted from this specific method that we implied here. Um, so because the choice of bias correction method affects, um, affects the resulting stream flows time series, we are applying different bias correction method to gain some estimate of the uncertainty introduced in this step. And we are planning to share um, the bias corrected RCM simulations um, yeah, in due time with the community. So if you're interested, please get in touch. And yeah, the next steps will be to use this, these different bias corrected data sets in a set of hydrological models, um, which includes rainfall runoff models, groundwater models, and water resources system models of Anglian water. And I believe that will be my time, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Um, Um, we have a question from Ben. Uh, he says, can the correction be applied in real time for use in operational hydrological modeling? Um, so that's not really um, what I'm doing in this case. Um, yeah, because what, what you're doing with the bias correction is to adjust the distributions of these um, yeah, climate projections in yeah, for future, for example. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not sure if if, they, if it would be appropriate to ex apply the ex exact same methods in operational hydrological model modeling. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've got another question. Um, so what are the challenges um, in terms of bias, bias corrections? So is it, for example, uh, precipitation projections more challenging than temperature projections? Or, um, yeah, that was my question about, yeah. And uh, yeah, so, so look, looking at the um, yeah, performance of the model, it does seem like precipitation is far more challenging. And yeah, and in general, uh, projections of precipitation, um, yeah contain far more uncertainty than projections in, in temperature, for example. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But yeah, we will continue to evaluate the bias correction methods um, yeah, before they are ready for sharing with the community. Uh, Perfect. Yeah, sounds very interesting and very nice plots. Yeah. Um, well, so that's the end of poster session B. I'd like to thank uh, all the speakers for their excellent posters and excellent presentations, and also thanks for the attendees. We have now at quarter at quarter to two the keynote speaker session, and I'd like to invite you all because we are going to have three excellent speakers, and we hope to see you there. Thank you very much. Bye.